Well, thank for you for that beautiful offertory and special music. We really appreciate it. We don't get to hear special music here all that often, and we appreciate it when we do. We are now entering a phase of holy days that have not been fulfilled yet. Pentecost, or the Passover rather, and unleavened bread and Pentecost have to a large extent or some extent been fulfilled, but the rest of the holy days, these fall holy days, have not been fulfilled at this point, at least not entirely. Their pre-types may have. I brought in my appointment book with me today. And I didn't bring it to show you how busy I am or how much I do. I brought it to make a point of how important it is to me, how important my appointments are to me and my appointment book is to me. I um, am prone to forgetting things, to missing things, and so forth, so I give myself a backup. I have a, uh, all of these appointments written that I want to keep written down in, in this book. And as if that's not enough, I have a backup to a backup. I also put them in my phone, which um, I'm beginning to think, I'm not too sure if, it's, if I'm controlling it or it's controlling me. I'm not quite sure, probably a little of both, to be honest about it, because it talks to me sometimes when it's not supposed to. <clears throat> But I write all the important things that I want to do or the important appointments that I want to keep. I write them in this book. And some of you or perhaps a lot of you may do the same thing so that you don't forget things. You have either a calendar you write it on or you have a, a, some kind of a notebook or some kind of an appointment book, a day timer, whatever you want to call it. And you write your appointments in there so you don't forget them. Now, it works great if you put the right thing on the right day. Here, here recently, um, I, I had a little bit of some health issues, so I went to the hospital, and they wanted me to make a follow-up appointment with my doctor, which I did. I didn't have a doctor, so we had to scramble around and try to find a doctor, and I finally did. And it's not as easy as you might think. So many of them don't even want to take on new clients or see you. So we finally got one to, that we felt comfortable with to do that. Wrote it in the appointment book, put it in my phone. And at the appointed time, we got there. And at that point, we, were, we had to stay in the parking lot because they weren't letting you come in and wait in the waiting room because of the COVID um, uh, mandates and restrictions and so forth. So we stayed in our car, and we went ahead, and we either text or called them. I think we might have called them. And it was getting to be about our appointment time, which was 4.30. We had gotten there a little before then. We called them, or texted them. I believe we ended up calling them. And they said, what are you doing here? It's, your appointment was at 3.30. It wasn't at 4.30. It was, it was at 3.30. So... Obviously, we missed our appointment because they said, we're going home at 4.30. So there won't be any time for you to keep an appointment today. So we made another appointment a week later, and we did get back. And all's well that ends well, and we, we, we end, it ended up working. But again, the information in here is only as good as what I put into it, or my phone the same way. It's only as good as what I put into my phone. I'm sure you could have many appointment stories yourself, that you could think back of appointments you've missed or appointments you've been there at the wrong time or, or appointments that you couldn't make or whatever. I ran into one guy, he was coming home from, uh, I was in Cleveland coming home and he was in, I don't know where he'd been, in the Akron area. And in the Akron area, I came on him and he is, as I was following him, all of a sudden his right front wheel took off without him got right off the car and went flying down the road. Fortunately, nobody got hurt. But he, uh, I stopped, and he told me, he said, I'm going to miss my appointment. He said, I'm on my way back, and it's actually, I'm in my 90-day grace period on my job. He was a bus driver 
for the city of Canton, and he was pretty distraught with the fact that he was going to miss his appointment. He made his appointment because I, I took and dropped him off and his family took care of the car. But you probably have your own stories with missing, missing appointments and missing, missing things you wanted to do for one reason or another, a traffic jam or all kinds of, all kinds of things that can happen. But appointments in general are important to us. And this is my important appointment book, but I have one other book, and you do too, that is more important than this one. And it's right here in our hands, on our tables. It's the, the Word of God. And the reason I say that is what we're going to get into in a little, in a little bit. Because we are here today to celebrate one of those appointments. Now, if I, again, like in the offertory, I can tell you that we're going to look at one, at one of these appointment days, and you probably know right where to go without me even telling you. And you would be right. It's in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, where all the holy days are listed, including the um, Feast of Trumpets. Here, we're going to look at a couple of the, right now, just momentarily, to a couple of the first verses here, in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. In verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses. Now, it says the Lord, and that is in um, um, all uppercase letters. Most Bibles, mine included, this is the New King James. Most of them will put the word Lord if it's translated from Jehovah or Jehovah or Yahweh, those letters, as uppercase all uppercase letters, L-O-R-D, uppercase, because it means the self-existent one or the eternal, as we've come to, come to know. And he said in verse 2, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy, these are my feasts. These are my feasts. He lists the Sabbath then, and then he goes on in verse 4. For these, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, holy assemblies, like we're sacred assemblies, like we're doing here today. This is a sacred assembly coming before God, which you shall proclaim at their appointed time, at their appointed time. These are, as I said, appointments. In fact, if you look at the word feasts in, in verse 2, uh, it's mentioned twice there, and then it's mentioned once in verse 4 in my Bible. Uh, the same word, though, is, is at the end of the verse, is translated appointed times. That word, and I'm since, it's, it's the word, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture this in Hebrew. It's, it's pretty simple sounding word, moed, M-O-E-D. And if you're familiar with Strong's, um, the Strong's, uh, not translation, but the, the uh, Strong's uh, uh, Bible, there you go, thank you, concordance. It, it, the word was stuck up there, it just wasn't moving. But anyway, if you look at the Strong's concordance, or if you know anything or much about it, that word is number 4150. Strong's took every Hebrew word and every Greek word and a couple, uh, another translation, maybe uh, Aramaic or so on, and they gave it a number. They numbered it so that we can refer to it, and pretty much that numbering system has been adopted across most reference works. And this particular one is 4150, and it means appointed times, appointed festivals, appointed places, and so on. It's an appointed thing. So these are the appointed festivals of God, the appointments with God. And that's the title of my message, Appointments with God. In verse 24 of this verse, or of this chapter, chapter 23 and verse 24, it says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, which that's today, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. 
a holy convocation. The word trumpets is not actually here, but it's indicated, or it's, it's um, uh, a word that um, is, like I said, indicated by the context. A holy convocation, a holy assembly like we're doing here. The word blowing means to signal an alarm or to shout or a battle cry or rejoicing or cheering is what the word blowing actually in, in the Hebrew what it means according to Strong's and other concordances. And this is what we are to be doing here. We're to be meeting here together as the church with an appointment with God. Now, we might be surprised to learn that there have been appointments of time or appointed times since creation. There have been appointed times since creation. In fact, we'll go back to the very first chapter of the, in the Bible, Jap, uh, Genesis chapter 1, and here it lists, of course, the creation of God day by day by day. In the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, and the third day, and so on. But then we come to the fourth day, and in verse 14 of chapter um, Genesis 1, God said, let there be lights. Again, that's Genesis 1, verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. And they're for a reason. He said to divide the day from the night and to let them be for signs and for appointed times or seasons. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. The sun and the moon regulate time. The moon especially is what regulates the holy day. When we read in, in um, Leviticus, the 23rd chapter in verse 24, that it said on the, in the seventh month, it means on the seventh new moon, the seventh month, the new moon. Here, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I think, it was about, I think it was about two weeks ago, we were with some friends and we were out after dark and we looked up in the sky and here there was a full moon and we realized at that point that in one month one more new moon or not new moon but one full moon because the moon was full we we realized that in one more month it would be the first day of the feast of tabernacles that's how the holy days are uh, generally are determined or how we know the new moon the full moon that's how they're that's basically how we measure when that's going to be. And we count the, the new moons, one, two, three, four, and so on. And then we come to the days in that, during that new moon when the, when the uh, feasts are going to be. And here it says that they were appointed seasons or appointed times. That's what those heavenly bodies are there for, as well as to give light. Because he said the uh, it's verse 16, he said, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, which is the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made stars also. On a clear night, we can go out and we can see millions of stars, uh, sort of. We can see that there are stars up there, and we can see things like the Milky Way and so forth, and see more stars than we can count or that we can even really see. The reason they call it the Milky Way is because all these lights shine together, so far out and it looks like, a, like it's sort of cloudy or milky up there. But that's why God made them. In fact, in uh, Psalms, the 104th chapter of Psalm, Psalms 104, we don't know for sure if this was David. It doesn't really say that David wrote this Psalm, but we suspect he probably did, or he may have. But in Psalms 104, He's, whoever the writer was said that God, in verse 19, that God appointed the moon for appointed times, for seasons, for appointed times, the moed, for appointed times. So he, when, when we see a full moon out there, we see a, the, that first little sliver of the new moon, we know that that's the beginning of a month. And then we could count if... Uh, 
as in, in the case of the Feast of Trumpets, it's the first day of that new moon. When we see that new moon is when that day is, but for the Feast of Tabernacles, it's on the 15th day of the first month. So that would be the full moon. And that's also listed in Leviticus 23rd chapter. We won't go there for that, but we will go back there. There's one little little thing that I wanted to, a loose end I wanted to tie up there just to clarify in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And that's the very last word, verse of that chapter. Leviticus 23 and in verse 44. And it says, So Moses declared the, to the children of Israel, Moses declared this. What did he declare? The feasts of the Lord. These were not Moses' feasts. These were not the feasts of the children of Israel. These were the eternal's feasts. These were the eternal's appointed times. It's that same word there in, um, in verse 44, the feasts, the appointed times. Those were the appointed times that God set in motion, that God gave. And appointed times, as I mentioned, and as we looked at in Genesis, the first chapter, appointed times started at the creation. I guess without the sun and the moon, you couldn't really have time, I don't think. Uh, maybe smarter people than me could figure out that we would, but I, I, I don't know how. Without something to delineate days, months, and years, and so forth. Again, they were from the beginning. And another thing, and we can, we can figure this out, we can read about these. God's plan also began at the beginning. Now, the holy days, as we've come to learn, are a, an outline of God's plan. The holy days are an outline of God's plan. And God shows us things about his plan through the holy days that we could not otherwise know if we didn't know about the holy days. Or it even makes it easier for us if we actually observe and keep the holy days. And one of these places is in Titus that we find the, that this was God's plan was from the beginning or even before time began, as it says in Titus 1. And we'll read verse 1 to 3. It says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, that's verse 1, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. In verse 2, in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. There was a plan in place before time began for eternal life. And as you go through the Bible, and we go through the Bible, we see that this, this plan included Jesus Christ, who had to die for our sins, and he had, he had to come to this earth physically to die for our sins. And that took a plan. There was a plan, and that plan included the holy days. That plan included the appointed times of God. Again, verse 2, verse two of Titus 1. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. He worked out this plan before time began. Turn them back to Matthew, the 25th chapter, which this is part of the famous Sermon on the Mount, it's, uh, which includes 24 and, 20, and chapter 25. Uh, it's, a pretty, pretty big, it's a pretty big sermon that uh, Jesus Christ gave there. But in verse, or Matthew 25 and... In verse 34, this is part of a, the par parable of the sheep and the goats. 
and it, it involves the return of Jesus Christ. 31, it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. This is talking about the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep. <laughs> and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Prepared for you. This was made ready. This was worked on. This was all planned out, worked on from the foundation of the world way long before, uh, obviously before Jesus Christ came, and long before that from the foundation of the world. This was all prepared. It was all uh, planned out. You remember in one place, uh, Jesus Christ said in John, I forget which chapter, that I go to prepare a place for you, these mansions, and I'll bring them back. Well, this was all in the preparation long ago, long before, before uh, Christ was sacrificed. God did not do things in a haphazard manner. He does things in a prepared and an organized, in a, a thought out and worked out way. When, when, um, Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve were tempted by Satan, the devil, in the form of a snake, that, was not a, uh, that w did not thwart God's plan. God had a plan for all the contingencies and all the things that were going to, going to happen. He had a plan that was going to be worked out no matter what. With our human nature, we all sin. And God was prepared for that. And Jesus Christ came, obviously, as we know, came so that there was a way back for the separation that we had with God to be repaired, the breach to be repaired, and we would be able then to reunite with God. And there's a holy day coming up shortly that's, that's going to point out more about that. But in these two places, we can see that this was all worked out long ago, long before uh, Jesus Christ, long before um, the apostles, long before the, the New Testament church, and so on. This was all, goes all the way back to the foundation of the world. But for us to follow the thread of today's appointment, why would we worry about what's going on today with these particular holy days? of what relevance or what significance do they have or would they even have? Why, why would they mean anything today? And as a matter of fact, when we read in Leviticus the 23rd, it says, God said to Moses, speak to the children of Israel. So why do we have to be worried about it? What good are they for us? Or do they have any relevance or significance to us at all? Well, I, I wanted to consider something that Paul said. And he wrote this to Timothy. Timothy, we might remember, was a young pastor, a young uh, pastor that was a protege of Paul's. He was, he was a, uh, at times, a traveling companion, and he was a help to Paul along his, in his ministry to the Gentiles and so forth. And um, Timothy, interestingly enough, was, had, had a, a Jewish mother and a Gentile father, so so he was probably well suited for the job of, of pastoring churches that may have been largely or somewhat Gentile. But in Timothy, the third chapter, the second Timothy, the third chapter, because Paul wrote two letters to Timothy. Second Timothy, the third chapter. And in verse 14, he says something interesting to Timothy. And that is, in verse 14, 2 Timothy 3, you must continue, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. From childhood you've known these scriptures that were 
that are able to make you wise unto salvation, and you must continue in them. Now, we might say, well, yeah, it's all there in the, in the Gospels and so on, Gospels and the writings and, and so forth, on through Revelation. But the problem was, these are not the scriptures that he's talking about because those scriptures were not in play yet at that point. Those scriptures were not uh, codified into as holy scripture at that point. So the scriptures he was talking about were the law, the prophets, the writings, what we would call the Old Testament. Those scriptures, and he said you must continue in them, and he said in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's all given by inspiration of God. The Old Testament is inspired by God just as the New Testament is, and it's able, as he said here, to make you wise unto salvation. God put these things in place. He made the sun and the moon, and he, Paul told Timothy to keep those things in mind because it's able to make you wise unto salvation. And if it was that important, we probably should pay attention to that, to them, to these things. Jesus Christ and the apostles did. We find that scattered throughout the uh, New Testament and in through the uh, writings of Paul and, and Acts and so forth, uh, that Jesus Christ and the apostles continued to follow these New Testament, if you will, or Old Testament, rather, um, holy days that were given to the Israelites. And why would they do that? Chapter ten, or, uh, 7 of uh, John is a famous place where Jesus Christ had gone, went up to the um, Feast of Tabernacles and he had uh, uh, talked about coming to him, invited all people to come to him to receive living water. And this was a pretty good example of Jesus Christ doing this because Jesus Christ risked his life he risked his life to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, to go up to Jerusalem and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In verse 2 of chapter 7, it says, the, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. It was, it was uh, coming up. It was, and, and basically, as we read the, a little while ago for the offertory in uh, Deuteronomy 16.16, 16, these were in seasons. They were the season of the Passover, unleavened bread, and the season of the Feast of Weeks, and then the, the season of the Feast of Tabernacles. And they were all um, sort of lumped together. The, we call them the Fall Holy Days. We lump them together as well, the Fall Holy Days. It says, Now the Jews of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles was at hand, and his brothers, therefore, uh, said, Hey, depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples may see the works that you do too. And verse 5, we find that even his brother, they were brothers, were skeptical. They didn't really believe in Jesus Christ either. They, didn't, they weren't sure or didn't think that maybe he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. His brothers didn't, did not believe in him. But in, in verse 10 is, is the verse that I wanted to uh, um, share with you. The first, the first thing is we, we realize or we know that the feast that was coming up was the Feast of Tabernacles, or at least that feast season. When his brothers had gone, verse 10, had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret, again, because the Jews sought him at the feast. They thought, well, he'll surely be here. If he would have traveled with his brothers and his normal, his usual group of people that he, that he uh, was associated with, he would have easily been spotted. But here he just could blend in with the crowd because crowds and crowds of people would descend on Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles and the Fall Holy Days. So he could easily sort of be, uh, sort of be lost in the crowd, so to speak. Today, with cameras and video and all kinds of images and whatnot, 
that's no longer possible because people would know what uh, other people look like. But in, not in those days, they couldn't do that. So he could be, he could easily uh, become lost uh, amongst the shuffling of crowds and so forth with other people. So he was able to go, but he went in secret because the Jews wanted to find him and they wanted to kill him because they were jealous of him because he was attracting a lot of attention and it drew away from their authority and from their, from their following. So he, he went, but he went secretly at that point, but at great risk to himself. He wasn't going to let a little thing like death or the threat of death stop him from going to the feast. Acts the first or the second chapter, we know what happened there. In Acts, the second chapter is one of the more famous attending of feasts, and that is on the day of Pentecost. And that's in, in um, the first chapter, or the second chapter in the first verse. Acts 2 in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all, they being the, the um, apostles at that point and, and the followers of Jesus Christ, were all in one, with one accord in one place. They had come to keep the day of Pentecost. There are many, many places in the Bible in the New Testament where we can see where Christ or his apostles had been associated with or kept the, kept the uh, uh, holy days. That it, the, in our booklet, the United Church of God booklet, God's Holy Day Plan, there is a list on page 7. I think we have a couple of these booklets over here, if anybody would care to look at it. Nowadays, if you don't want to take the booklet, you can take your smartphone out and take a picture of it, and you'll have it uh, to take home and look them up. But it lists, uh, gives a whole list. I don't know. There must be 20 uh, or more uh, references here to places that where uh, God's festivals in the New Testament were observed by Jesus Christ and the apostles of the church in the New, in the New Testament. So you, we have ample record of it. It's not that we're lacking for records of that having happened. Um, there are other places where, where there are indications of it where we, it doesn't specifically say this feast or that feast or this holy day or that holy day, but we know that it was a holy day by the, by the context. Now, this particular feast is not mentioned by name as a feast in the New Testament. But there are many places where trumpets is designated. We know that trumpets, the, the trumpet, and uh, I know... Um, he tooted his own horn, as he said this morning. It wasn't exactly a, a shofar or a, a, a silver trumpet, but it was, it was still a, 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 an instrument for blowing wind through and making a noise. And we know that these were very important in the Old Testament because they used them for everything from calling uh, for, for war, journeys, calling assemblies. We can go back. We, we won't do it here because it's a whole chapter of it. Uh, Numbers, the 10th chapter, if you want to refer to that, write it down. You can later go on or back there sometime and see all the different things that trumpets were used for, to calling the, the um, uh, camp together for assemblies, journeys, uh, and to begin month, when the Feast of Trumpets would have been announced, would, would have been with a, with a trumpet of some kind. Probably a shofar, I believe, would be used for that, possibly. But nonetheless, they were very important for that purpose. They were important for war. Actually, they were used for war in wartime uh, situations for many, many years. Even in the U.S. military, I believe there was a bugle corps, and the bugle was a form of the trumpet, and I believe there was a, a bugle corps in the military that would... Um, be used for calling assemblies and so forth. I remember one time we went to the Feast of Tabernacles and we all almost got thrown into the pokey that particular year. We were out in, uh, uh, it was close to the Norfolk, uh, Virginia, 
naval shipyard. And we went into this place where we were going to stay at this hotel. And it was right next to a military base. And instead of making the right turn, so it was at a Y, instead of making a right turn to sort of go into the complex we were staying at, I took a left turn and this was into the military compound. Well, we were accosted by armed, armed guards and they, they let us go, they turned us around, they did want to know what we were doing, why we were there, what happened and so forth, but we, this was before cell phones and before, before GPS and all of those things. All we knew was written instructions or maybe printed out instructions. So we, we got in there, they turned us around and they sent us on our way. Um, our, our pride might have been hurt a little bit, but that was about it. And then we did get to our, um, our accommodations, but we were on the hotel on the, about the third or fourth floor and we were on the side where the military base was. So every morning we got uh, awakened with bugles, the bugle call, I, I suppose, for, for mess or whatever they were, they were doing. I'm not familiar enough with all the military um, signals and whatnot to tell you for sure what they were doing, but I know I heard it. And it would wake us up in the, in the morning. And it was okay because it wasn't, you know, at 3 o'clock. It was probably at 6 o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was. And we were okay with that. But the, the uh, trumpets still have relevance today. Even though they had relevance in, in the Old Testament and they were important, they still have relevance in the New Testament as well. We are asked to come before God in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, in verse 24, as a memorial of blowing of trumpets. To remember, it's a reminder. It says, don't forget. Do not forget. It's a reminder. It can also picture things ahead of us. It's a shadow of things to come. We won't go there, but Colossians 2 and in verse 17 tells us that these holy days and new moons and so forth would be a shadow of things to come. Hebrews, said, Hebrews says, I think in chapter 8 or 9, that it's a shadow of the good things to come. That there, these, uh, some of these things are a shadow of good things to come. Trumpet, trump, or trump, or trumpeteer, is mentioned 14 times in the New Testament. It's mentioned 14 times in the New Testament. 11 of those times are in an end time context. 11 of those times are in an end time context. And since we're memorializing trumpets, when we want to know what it means, we have to look for where trumpets are mentioned or where trumpets are indicated. And there, are, as I said, 11 of those times in an end time context Four of those times are announcing the return of Jesus Christ. Four times in the New Testament, trumpets are used to announce the return of Jesus Christ. This is why we've come to associate the Feast of Trumpets with the return of Jesus Christ. The Feast of Trumpets we have come to associate with the return of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at these four records that... Uh, were recorded concerning the return of Jesus Christ and trumpets. We, um, we had a, um, our, um, the fellow that gave the sermonette, Scott Thuvenin, he was uh, a suspicious man and he suspected that we were going to maybe repeat some of these accounts. And sure enough, we are. He was right. His suspicions are going to be confirmed. Now, I had um, earlier talked to Aaron Dean and told him what, I was going to be using, and he said, oh, great, that'll leave me the whole rest of the Bible to, to give my message, so expect a broad, a broad sermon. But at any rate, the first one we're going to look at is in Matthew, the 24th chapter. Again, back to the, to the um, Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, we probably recall, was where Jesus Christ was and his uh, disciples came out of the temple 
And they were all excited to show Jesus Christ the great buildings of the temple. This was, I believe, Herod's temple that had been, was pretty ornate. And it had been um, um, pretty, pretty uh, probably could say, idolized by the Jewish people, those who used it. And it was used a lot. And, but they, what they wanted to know was, um, or Christ told them when they said, oh, look at all these beautiful buildings, he told them, their time is coming when not one stone will be left on top of the other here. And then, of course, that prompted the question, well, when will these things be, and when will be the, you be returning, and when will be the, the um, end of this age? So he went into a whole listing and um, step by step, it's probably not comprehensive, but into a, a broad outline of when these things are going to be. Uh, see, the first thing he said, see that you be not deceived. Don't let anybody deceive you. Uh, there's an orderly way this is going to be done. We can look through the Bible now. They, they um, didn't have the New Testament then, but we can look through the Bible and the Old Testament. We have Daniel and many other, uh, the prophets, prophets minor and, and the writing prophets that outline and tell us when these things are going to be. Yeah, they're veiled, and we don't necessarily know all the details, but they're there. We can watch for different signs and markers, and that's what Christ did here. He went step by step uh, through this. He, got, he gets up to verse 12 where he says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And he said um, many other things. He said, pray that your flight be not in winter nor on the Sabbath day. And so on down to where he comes to verse 30, as he had already outlined many things that were going to happen. There were going to be earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and, and um, many, many, many things that were going to be affecting our life and the life of people down through time that would be all be steps towards the return of Jesus Christ. Then in verse 30, he comes up to the point where he says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. As you remember, his first appearance was pretty humble. It wasn't, it wasn't very, um, he wasn't signaled with great fanfare worldwide and so on. He came as a little baby in a manger because there was not room enough for him anywhere in, um, in any lodging facilities for, for Mary, his mother, <clears throat> and Joseph, his dad, to go for Jesus to be born. So he was, at, he was born in a, in a stable, in a manger. And then verse 31, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. The great sound of a trumpet will announce <clears throat> excuse me, the return of Jesus Christ. It will, he had earlier said, we're, we're not going to be missing this. Um, if, if they say Jesus Christ is here or he is there, don't go there. Because when he comes, we will know. As lightning, he said in verse 27, comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will also the coming of the Son of Man be. It will be a known, it will be something known. It's not going to be done in a corner. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. It's going to be a major event, such a major event that, as we read earlier today, or as we heard earlier today in the, in the um, sermonette, that there will be gatherings of people coming to fight against Jesus Christ at his return. First of all, they, don't, they won't understand it. And secondly, it's just like the Pharisees, this is encroaching on their territory and we can't have this. Whatever it is, we're going to squelch it. That's their attitude. That's the first place that we hear this. The second place is we're going to go to a place we've already been, and that's 1 Corinthians 15. It's the, called the resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 15. 
And we'll, we'll be reading from verse 50 to 52. Paul here is writing to the church at Corinth. Corinth had many issues. We remember in the, in the first few chapters where they had the issues with, uh, in, the, in the church and Paul had to correct that and it concerned the, um, it was at the Passover and unleavened bread time. And then they also had a problem with, there were people who believed that there was no resurrection. And maybe that was a faction of the Sadducees who didn't believe that there was a, a resurrection and maybe they had come in the church and brought some of their beliefs with them. Uh, doesn't really say for sure, but nonetheless, there were people here that were preaching the, or, or promoting that there was no resurrection. And Paul, of course, said that if there's no resurrection, then we are of all men most miserable because we have nothing to look forward to. We're living this life and that's it. We're done. We're in the grave. We rot away and never to be heard from again. But, but Paul is letting them know that that is not the case. And for this reason, it adds to our knowledge and our information about what is going to happen. Verse 50, this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. In our present physical flesh and blood state, we could not survive in a spiritual kingdom. We, cannot, we could not make it. It's not it is not designed for flesh and blood. But behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. And I find this, there are a couple places where Paul says, we shall not all sleep, that we, where he indicates that he thinks. And many people down through the years have always thought that. And I think it almost has to be that way to give us the proper urgency. Otherwise, my Lord delays his coming. It's way out there in the future, beyond even my lifetime, probably. We, we can't afford to think that way. We have to have an urgency about our life and what we do. And Paul probably did uh, the same thing, but he mentioned on several occasions that we, we, we will be here when Christ comes. Behold, I tell you, mystery, we shall all, not all sleep, but we shall be, all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Now we're going through these in a, in a, uh, these four uh, mentions of the return of Christ. We're going through these in the, in the chronological uh, fashion in the way they were put in, in the book, in, in the Bible. Uh, but anyway, for the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And again, we shall be changed. We shall be changed. Uh, what Paul said was absolutely true. He did not see the return of Christ himself, but he will see the return of Christ when Christ comes his second, for the second time. He'll, he'll see Christ. He will be there at that resurrection, and then he will see Christ. When Christ says, come forth, Paul, Paul will come forth. We'll go on to the next, to the next mention. The next mention of this is in 1 Thessalonians and in chapter 4. I'll leave you guys get a head start here. I seem to get to the, to the scriptures too quickly. And um, this way, there we go. 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. Again, this is Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica. He is pointing out some things, and again, he's talking about the return of Christ and the resurrection. Verse 15, we'll read from verse 15 to verse 17. This we say, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, there he goes again, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, those who have died, we're not going to be the first. They will rise first, then we will rise. For the Lord himself will des descend from heaven with a shout. And we remember the word, the, the word blowing in uh, uh, describing the uh, Feast of Trumpets uh, could be a shout too. From heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet 
of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So here again, Paul is verbalizing or explaining how this resurrection will work with a trumpet. A trumpet call will announce the return of Jesus, Jesus Christ. And now we'll go to the last one of these four, which we also have already been there. The last one of these four. And this one is in the book of Revelation, the revelation that God gave to Jesus Christ, who gave it to John to give to his servants. <laughs> Paul, or John, went through a whole series of revelation after revelation of incident after incident, and it's concerning the last days, the latter days. Concerning the latter days, we will read in 11, verse 15, which we've already read, but we'll read it again. This, when you think about this, you can get goose pimples on your your arm. It makes you the hair stand up on your on your neck when you think about this and what is going to take place. I see a beautiful clear day outside and I imagine Jesus Christ coming on a day like today, returning to this earth to begin and set up his kingdom. It says the seventh angel sounded in verse 15. There were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. He will reign from there on. Now, it doesn't actually mention trumpets in that verse, but we have to, to, to realize that it's trumpets that's being talked about. We'd have to go back to the beginning of this series of trumpet blasts. And that is in chapter 8, and beginning in verse 1. It says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw these seven angels who stand before God, and he gave, to, and to them were given seven trumpets. There were seven trumpets that were going to sound before Jesus Christ, actually six of them before Jesus Christ was going to return to this earth and he was returning at the seventh or the last trump. They, the, the trumpets uh, at first go pretty quickly. The first trumpet is in verse, or the first trumpet sound by the angel was in verse 7, and uh, hail and fire followed that. Second angel sounded something like a great mountain fell into the sea. It was thrown into the sea. Third angel sounded in verse 10. A great star fell from heaven, and the results of that. Fourth angel sounded. Third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon was struck. Third of the sun and a third of the moon. Then the fifth angel sounded, and a star uh, fallen from heaven. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Then the sixth angel sounded in nine and in chapter nine, verse thirteen. And when the sixth angel sounded, uh, the things that that followed that sound, trumpet sound, were also recorded here. But then finally, we got over to where the seventh angel sounded the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, Again, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The last trumpet to sound, that's another appointment that God has with mankind, or that we have with God. The seventh trumpet, when Jesus Christ 
returns. And we, in the, I won't read it, but um, it was mentioned in the sermonette that there was a judgment that happened at that point. When that last trumpet sounded, the seventh trumpet, we mentioned about the shouting and cheering, and I believe that this would be a cause for shouting and cheering. I can imagine the people, all of us, shouting and cheering at the return of Jesus Christ. And it said that the, there were loud voices in heaven. I'm guessing there was shouting and cheering. Jesus Christ is going to receive his kingdom forever and ever. He will be the king that will never be replaced. He will be the king that will never, never fall. As important as we think our appointments are, as important as we think that our appointments are, our appointments with God are infinitely more important. And the most important appointments are still ahead of us. The most important appointments that we have with God in our life, in any life, are still ahead of us the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of God's kingdom and eternity in the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ and with God our Father. Trumpets were a communication system in the Old Testament. They were a communication system that worked well because they didn't have the technology we, we had. They didn't have an earbud in their ear telling them what to do. They had to rely on other methods of, being, of communication or of being told what to do. They were a communication system for God's and Jesus Christ's disciples in, the, in the, um, all ages. There's still a communication system for us today. We are still receiving messages by the trumpets. Today is a day that we're being communicated to through trumpets, through the knowledge, through the memorial that we're holding to the blowing of trumpets. Trumpets are still a communication system, as I mentioned, to God's disciples today. The Feast of Tabor, or, uh, Trumpets rather, communicates to us many things, but one of the things that it communicates to us, the Feast of Trumpets, is how we can grow in grace and knowledge and become wise unto salvation. We are saved by grace. We are not saved by keeping the Feast of Trumpets. But we can learn and we can grow and we can grow in grace and God, knowledge of God's way by observing the Feast of Trumpets, by observing God's appointments with us, appointments in time. But there is one thing, one important thing, that the Feast of Trumpets, or that's associated with trumpets, that we have a part in, that we can do, that we're instructed to do, as a matter of fact, that we're told to do, and we didn't get quite that far. It's in 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we wrote about, or read about rather, the trumpet, the shout uh, with a shout and the voice of an archangel with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ rising first, Jesus Christ returning. We read that part, and that those who are alive will and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. But there's, right at the end of this, there's a very important thing that we are told to do, that we are told that we can have a part in. In verse 18, it says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Keep these words fresh in our mind with ourself and with those around us. That's why we assemble on God's holy days to talk about what's coming, to keep those things alive, to keep the memorial going, to keep exhorting each other, to keep comforting each other with the words. Yes, it's tough. It's a struggle. It's a hard life. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. 
and this is it. Comfort each other with these words.